My name's uh, Stu Riff. Uh, I've been with Chris Hansen about uh, since October as uh, a sales account manager. Prior to that, I had been tech service uh, uh, with Karina uh, for, from 2006 till last October. Uh, I am a nutritionist and agronomist by trade and training, and uh, I know I'm not the one that you're here to see. So we'll get this first presentation out of the way. The reason we're kind of going about this presentation this way is that you know we know you guys are here to talk about kernel processing score, or gap settings. And, roller dif differentials, uh, speed differentials, and packing densities and all that. And we're going to get to that, but what we found is if we go right into that and that's all we talk about, you learn all sorts of great ways to set up your processor and how to make it stand on its head and everything, but you still don't come out necessarily knowing what your silage ought to look like in the first place. So rather than running circles, what we want to do is start basically by looking at corn silage from the cow's perspective because she's the one that we're doing all this work for. And then we'll go from there, kind of set up some, help you set up some goals for what your corn silage ought to look like. Then we'll go into the other presentations on how to actually get that kernel processing score where you want to pick up those sort of things. So that's how we're set up. Uh, so if you're a cow guy, I'm it. This is for you. If you're a gearhead, please hang in there for the next uh, half hour. We'll get through this and uh, I'll try to keep you awake. I got some videos and some color pictures so they're bright. I'll keep awake and we'll, we'll be able to go on. Um, I call this presentation the fourth ration. Uh, nobody knows what the fourth ration is, but uh, my logic behind the name is if you've ever spent any time talking to a nutritionist or going to any feed meetings, you always, you've probably been told that there's three rations that we feed a cow. There's the, uh, the ration that's on paper, the one that gets printed out, and since I was a nutritionist, obviously that was the perfect ration. Then there's the ration that you actually put in the mixer, mix up and put in front of the cow. That's the actual ration that gets fed. And then the third ration is, is that actual part of the ration that the cow actually consumes <coughs> after she gets done rubbing to the bottom and picking out the grain and sorting out the coarse stuff and throwing the rest over her back to chase the flies away. So those are the three rations that we typically talk about. The fourth ration that I want to talk about today is the ration that's actually inside that cow and how Things like kernel processing score, length of cut, shredding, things like that, can help you manipulate the actual digestion within the cow. So that's what we want to do is build the case for what should corn silage look like on my farm, not just what should corn silage look like in general. Because one size to find out really does not fit all the well at all. So uh, my objective is to build a case for why corn silage, length of cut, and kernel processing should be managed independently. You set. Length of cut on one place on the chopper, kernel processing score on another part of the chopper. They're not the same thing, they're not the same adjustment, don't treat them as the same thing. There's, there's a whole different set of reasons and logic behind setting your length of cut than there is behind setting kernel processing score or size. So they should be managed independently. If you take nothing else away from this, meaning please take this much away. Um, and basically what we'll get into is how the goals for length of cut is going to vary primarily by the percent corn silage in the ration or the forage makeup that's in the ration. Whereas our kernel processing score, you're going to want to vary that maybe by the proportion of starch that's in that corn silage. In other words, if I've got a 38% corn stock, uh, starch corn silage, it's a high grain, you know, grain variety or dual purpose, I might want a different uh, kernel processing score on that than I do if I've got 28 and a typical 28%. Uh, corn silage, uh, starch corn silage. From a nutrition standpoint, uh, if you want to take a nutrition note home, the biggest one here is digestibility isn't a static function. Uh, there is a, it's not static. I know when you send your forest sample in, we send a sample in, you get a 30 hour NDF digestibility or a 48 hour NDF digestibility, you get one number back. You get a 7 hour starch digestibility, you get one number back. Well, that one number really only reflects, reflects what happened in that, rate, in that analysis as it was getting run. It doesn't necessarily reflect directly what happens in that cow. And what actually happens in that cow, one cow is going to be different than what happens in the other as far as how effective that digestibility is. And actually, if you put that same feed process the same way in a cow that's, say, 30 days fresh, and then put it back to feed that same feed again, if she's 180 days fresh, she's going to have completely different digestibility even inside that same cow just because of the way she changes. So digestibility is not a fixed number, it's variable in things that 
make it vary is rate of digestion, how fast that feed can, is capable of being broken down. That's kind of a chemical factor there. And then the rate of passage, how long does it stay in the rumen? And that's a, a big thing we're going to concentrate on today. We, we always talk about rumen mass and, and we don't fit in the rate of digestion. We very rarely talk about rate of passage because it's not something we can get a good handle on. But that's uh, going to be probably two thirds of my presentation is, is looking at this rate of passage and how we can impact by particle size how things flow out. And uh, the other thing, we've spent a lot of time talking about room and mat. And I always tell you, you want to have long length of cut so we have good cut chewing and a good room and mat. We're going to have quite a bit of discussion about that. But the thing we also tend to overlook is we've got that room and mat floating around on the top of the room. But underneath that's a whole big pool of liquid. And actually, one of the fine particles uh, get soaked up and wet, become a little more dense, they'll fall to the bottom. They're actually <coughs> going to blow out of that, uh, they're going to be actually in that liquid fraction out in the mat. And once feed gets in that liquid fraction, that's basically the express route out of the rumen. So controlling where that feed stays in the, in the rumen versus the liquid versus the mat is also going to impact our, our rate of passage and how well that feed is digested. And the bottom line we're going to find out is that not all forms of fiber are going to behave the same, even though on paper they might look identical. So rather than give you a whole lecture with numbers and charts and, and graphs and stuff and tell you how feed digests in the rumen, I want to actually follow a ration through the cow so you can see how it behaves and how, uh, how you know, maybe what's happening. So the best ration I can think of is the one that was freshest in our mind. Uh, in Wisconsin here, I work primarily a little bit this neck of the woods when I was in the and not quite up this far too much. Uh, more in the uh, southwest and southeast parts of the state, but I think they're pretty much the same all over. Uh, our haylage supplies were pretty low coming into 2013. Uh, we had a 2012 drought, we had a lot of carryover. Uh, we couldn't wait for first cutting. Before we got a chance to even get to first cutting, we found out we had a lot of alfalfa winter till, but we don't have any alfalfa. Uh, then we find out that first cutting didn't come until the end of May, maybe even June. So we got a late first cut, not a lot of alfalfa to begin with. Our, because of our first cutting being so late, our NDF digestibility was a little bit below normal. On, uh, on that, and our second cutting, since that was also later, it was harvested in more heat, and our second cutting in the digestibility wasn't anything to write home about either. So we're short on haylage, and our fiber digestibility is nothing to write home about. So we have to feed a lot more corn silo this year. The good news was that I thought going into the harvest, we were going to have some pretty awesome corn silo. I know we had the drought, I know we planted it late, but the things I was looking at was that corn silage was normal to wet in moisture. Uh, and the big thing was our kernel and stalk actually dried down more evenly this year than typical. The last two or three years, we've really been fighting. Our, our kernel and our ear was usually ready a couple weeks to a month before our corn stalks seemed to be. We kept waiting for that whole plant to dry down. This year, uh, they dried down about at the same speed. So I was really encouraged to see that happen. Um, the NDF digestibility was a little bit, uh, the fiber digestibility was a little bit below average in our corn silage typically, uh, but I wasn't real super worried about it because again, corn silage is a little more for starch for energy, although the fiber is an important component. And uh, that, I thought the starch was our, our high point. The starch digestibility on paper was actually quite high for this time of year. It wasn't as high as the corn we had coming from 2012 that had been in the silo for a year and fermented and soaking things up. But whereas last year our corn silage, and especially our high moisture corn, was starting out, if you look at a seven hour starch digestibility, we were starting out at the very bottom of the digestibility curve or even below the even level of, of the calibration level. And this year we were starting out right from the get go in the medium digestibility range. So I was pretty psyched about that. What I thought was going to happen was that we might have, uh, because we got below average NDF digestibility in our daily and our corn silage, that's going to act and have a little more fill. In other words, it's going to stick in the room a little bit longer because it's not going to break down as fast. So if it's occupying more space in the room any longer, our dry matter intake is going to be a little bit lower. So I expect a little bit lower than normal dry matter intake and high fat protein fat levels because we have lots of fiber to digest. In that starch level thing with moderate starch levels and moderate starch digestibility, I'm thinking, okay, we got normal high starch digest in the room. And that corn salad is finally available in the room when I need it here when it's more feeding the green. So we should have good starch digestion, we should have good protein production from that fermentation. That's going to be converted to glucose, which goes to lactose, and we're going to have some pretty good milk this fall. And then it's reality setting. So what actually happened is we did have great components. Uh, a lot of guys were running four, four, one milk fat tests. Uh, milk protein was up, but instead of holding on milk, we lost five to ten milks like <coughs> pounds of milk like we usually do. And, and that was something we kind of blindsided a lot of folks. We did not expect to see that kind of drop. 
And another thing that went totally counter to what we expected, we expected driving our intakes to actually be a little bit low. And in reality, the intakes were a little bit high, especially when you compare to the, the lower amount of milk being produced. Uh, the cows just ate more feed than expected given that amount of fill. Now, later on, we got into 20 below weather and we ate a lot of feed then just to stay warm. But back, I'm talking October, November, December, these girls are eating more than they ought to. Because we didn't make as much milk and we ate more feed, our fish feed efficiency uh, dropped. So um, you have to start looking around and see what else is going on. Uh, some of the things we saw was the manure got very loose. Uh, we'll see what that kind of looks like, an explanation why. We saw some corn kernels in the manure, but not a lot. Uh, often we saw pieces of corn stalk or haylage or haylage stems in the manure. And that's the thing that really bugged me this year. We don't typically see that that bad. Last couple of years we've seen a lot of corn kernels in the manure, but we haven't seen a lot of that fiber. So uh, that, that was kind of bugging me. We had some uh, bubbly manure and some mucin casts. And what I mean by that is, it, is um, I'll demonstrate with these pictures. These are uh, uh, manure samples that have been sieved. You go into the kitchen and grab your spaghetti strainer, vegetable strainer, go out to the barn, throw a few cow pies in there, take her into the holding area, milk house, whatever, take your hose and hose it down. This is what you're going to see when you get all done. It is something that looks like this. And this is a cow that's mid to late lactation. This is an earlier lactation cow. Uh, or early in lactation cow. This is what I would call slightly below average fiber digestibility. I mean, um, we're not seeing a lot of corn. There's a piece there, a piece there, a piece there. Not a whole lot of that. We're not seeing a lot of big pieces of porridge. There's a little bit of corn stalk rind there. But, um, and you're supposed to see some fiber there anyway. I mean, when we're talking fiber digestibility, we're typically only talking in the order of 40 to 60 percent. So a lot of your feet's going to be coming through in the manure. And, but, but the key thing here is that it should, you shouldn't be able to tell what it was when it went in. And you can see with this, it's a lot of small, needly type particles. So what I, what I would rather see is it be a little more fuzzier than that. So if you want to be a kind of sewer manure, and you're seeing all these little bits, and you, you know, they look like little needles, that's OK. The particle size has been reduced. But I would rather be a little more fuzzier than that. This early lactation cow, this is more of a train wreck here. Here's a piece of corn stalk, here's a piece of the cross section of corn stalk, piece of corn stalk rind, kernel, 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 kernel. Uh, a lot worse. And we were just blowing feet through these girls too fast, and the stuff was coming through undigested. So this was what I call very poorly digested feet. I've seen a lot worse, but this was uh, definitely on the poor digestion side. This is almost normal, but not quite. I said I'd like to see it a little bit fuzzy. This is a dried manure sample, so now you know what I do for a hobby. Uh, Sip manure, dry it, whatever. Uh, this is blown up more, so the particles look bigger, but it is actually a little, uh, it, you can see it's kind of fuzzier. And the other point, I guess, is if you ever see me in Quick Trip or whatever buying coffee, you might want to get in line before me because now you know where my change has been. Um, so you might not want it, I guess, after I've had it. This is the loose manure, bubbly manure. Um, a lot of people will attribute loose manure to acidosis, and it is acidosis, but it's not necessarily ruminal acidosis. What's actually happening in here is we've got some, a lot of small pieces of corn here in the manure. Well, what had happened, we saw that poor <coughs> start to fiber digestibility, where all that feed got all the way out in the manure. Well, this kernel got through the rumen, they didn't get digested in the rumen, they didn't get digested in the small intestine, because that's our, usually if we can digest it in either one of those two places, that's what we want. But it got actually past those two all the way to the hind that's the large intestine and it fermented back there. Those conditions are very, very similar to a rumen because it's anaerobic, there's no oxygen back there, you've got a lot of microbes, now we're feeding it really good. So what's happening is it's producing acid just like it is in the rumen, it's producing gas just like it is in the rumen, and it's fermenting that feed all over again. We can recover a little of the energy of that uh, through by absorption of uh, some of the acid that gets across the gut wall, but this is, for the most part, any protein and everything back here is a total loss. And we're actually, we're actually maybe possibly hurting the cow a little bit in that as this ferments and produce, produces acid in the hind gut or in that large intestine, she doesn't have any saliva, but she doesn't have any buffer, you don't have any bicarb going back there. There's no way to protect that tender intestinal lining from the acid. So what happens is it sets up what they call an osmotic gradient and she sucks water back into the large intestine to dilute out that acid. 
So she's, that's why your manure is getting loose, is because you've got this fermentation, you've got high acid content in the large intestine. She's resorbing more water to dilute that acid out so she doesn't burn her guts up. And then the bubbles are coming because you've got gas from that fermentation. So that's just going to pass out with the manure. This is what uh, we refer to as mucin casts. Hopefully you don't see too many of these. Uh, we saw them more in Florida when I was down there because we had higher grain diets. Um, didn't see a lot of these until the last couple years in Wisconsin. And this year, frankly, fortunately, it's not quite as bad as last year. But what these are is if we have that fermentation in that hind gut, we get that acid level high enough, we actually burn and damage that gut lining. She's going to put a layer of mucus over top of that gut that, with that damaged spot so the skin can, that lining can heal underneath that slime layer. And then once it's healed, that's going to swap off and you find the manure. You'll actually be able to go, it's not just like snot or something. You can actually pick it up and, and, and it's, it's not real rough either. You can pick it up and pull it right out of the manure and it's going to retain its shape. Uh, so basically, this is reflecting the damage that was probably done a week or two before that. That we actually burned the guts on the cows um, and that put this protective lining over a heel and then swept that off. So we don't want to see that. But those are some of the things we're seeing in the manure. So why were we seeing these things? What was different this year? Why wasn't the ration performing like we expected it to? Well, the biggest difference was we had less haylage and a whole lot more corn sours than normal. Uh, Typically, we're seeing uh, great in the herds I was working with, more than 25 pounds of dry matter per head per day, around 80% of the total forage coming from corn silage, and we had more than a couple herds of where it was 100% of their corn uh, forage was coming from corn silage. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that corn silage was bad because we didn't have fiber, because really, when we looked at it, we were balancing the same specs. Our fiber levels were the same. Our physically effective fiber was the same. Everything was the same except for we created for uh, fiber from haylage for fiber from corn silage. So what was going on in the rumen? We always talk about rumen mats and things like that. This is a diagram of a rumen. So this, we're going to get into the nu nutrition part, physiology, physics, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so bear with me. Um, it gets a little better. This is the drawing of the rumen. This is the reticulum. This is where your magnet would end up when you give them a magnet or whatever from hardware. Your esophagus or your feet comes in here. The between these two lines typically is where your rumen mat is. That's going to be, uh, you know, what we describe as what's supposed to be holding your feet in the rumen a little longer. But below that is this liquid pool. And it, the rumen contracts and moves speed around. And then the top, we kind of get a back and forth thing with the mat. But underneath, we actually get a cycle. And what happens is that's actually washing the liquid and have your particles up and out the omasal orifice. So you can see it a little bit in this one here. Let's get the head of it. So this is the, the reticulum <coughs> contracts and spits the bolus up and then the whole front of the, the rumen will contract, pushes the feed back, the back contracts <coughs> and pushes it forward and that's your mixing and when it pushes it forward that's when it's going to hit that omasal orifice and pop out. This is how she belch, the, again the reticulum <coughs> contract and push the bolus up. We're going to again push that feed and everything back but when she belches She's got a, the rear contraction is a little different, so we can push that gas bubble up so she can belch. But the key thing is we got the we've got that cycling, and we're pushing the feet out the uh, omasal orifice there. So that's how it's worked. And this is where your rumen mat would be. We always talk about rumen mats, you know, but not many people have seen one. This is a cannulated cow at the University of Pennsylvania or Penn State, excuse me. This is a rumen mat for a cow fed a high heat diet. And when we talk about rumen mass, we talk about what is it supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to catch my corn, corn particles, my grain particles. It's supposed to hold them up here so they get digested and don't blow out of the rumen too fast. So if you see something like this, this is pretty dry, very integrated, you know, the, the fibers all mesh and everything. So this thing's going to have an awesome potential to hold your forage and everything and your, your grain particles up high. But uh, we don't typically have an all hay diet, so the ration's not going to look quite like that. Uh, this is a little thing I couldn't help but, but throw in here. We've all seen the cow spitter cut up, and it's a little dark, but if you can watch right here, this is the cut coming back down. So now you've seen the cut go both ways. Uh, this is the esophagus, you see a little water squirt through maybe, and then all of a sudden it'll open up and she'll spit one out. So there, there's the cut actually coming back down. So now you've seen the cut go both ways. 
do it one more time before we get there we go. So now just before lunch. Um, a, a rumen that might be a little more, this is the rumen that's out of a cow, they cut it open. This is what would be the rumen mat. This would be a cow fed more silages, primarily more haylage, as you can tell by the looks of it. But you can see that that's still pretty integrated. And you can see that it does float on that water. As they push it around, it pops back up. So it does float on the liquid part. We're not, we're not filling it full of smoke that way. And uh, it, does, it does actually lock up and form a fairly good mass. So that something like that should, again, hold your, your grain parts up in the room pretty well. I don't have a video or a picture of a cow on a high corn silage diet. But if we look at the at corn silage and the properties that we've got coming from that, here's what we've got. Uh, this is for, I think we'll see something about this later. But, uh, this is just corn fodder from fresh corn silage floating on top of water. You're not getting that same locking together of the particles like you do with that haylage and with the hay. So yeah, we've got we've got effective fiber. It's big. She's going to chew her cut. We've got lots of stuff. She's got to reduce that particle size. But it's not going to hold the stuff in the room in the same way that that haylage and, and, and dry hay will. And that is one of the big things that we can't put in a model to figure out very well. And one of the reasons why things are a little bit uh, weird this year. Okay. The other thing that goes along with that is that rumen mat not only is holding fine particles up in the, in the top of the rumen and keeping it from washing out, it's just going to hold those particles together. And again, if those corn silage particles don't, don't uh, lock, interlock and, and form a mat that's going to stay where it stays put, what happens is when, if you watch right here, this is where the, the omasal orifice works up. You can't, it's, it's hard to see, but it's like a river flowing down a hole in the ground. It just Everything that's there goes out. There's no, yeah, there's not a lot of selection. So if we got all that haylage stuck together, that's going to hang back in the room and not get sucked out when all that other stuff washes. But if we got loose corn silage, when that hole opens up and everything, all that liquid flow, some of that uh, free corn silage stalks go through. So that's how we got those chunks of corn stalk in our manure, those other samples. Uh, pictures. Uh, if you uh, work with uh, FFA or 4-H kids, uh, those videos come from a video called From Feed to Milk from Penn State University. <coughs> you order bread from Ben Heinrich, it's $20. If you order it from their media center, it's $40. But, um, they, it's pretty neat. They, 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 there's a lot of explanation and voiceover on that. I explain all that. It's good for kids. But anyways, that was all nice theory, and you showed me all these nice pictures, but is there any <coughs> research to back up to that, what I just said could actually happen? Well, it just so happens I'm very well. Um, my wife is Dr. Ray Beth Hall at the USDA Dairy Ford Research Center in Madison. She typically works with starches and sugars and non-fiber carbohydrates, but she did a little study a couple years ago where she looked at uh, comparing different uh, fiber sources and what that happened to site, uh, rumen pH and site of di digestion. So basically, what she wanted to compare was uh, two different types of effective fiber. So she used either chopped wheat straw or chopped and soft corn stover. And the way she got the chopped and soft corn stover was, is they went out and combined that corn while it was still green, and uh, then they went back and chopped the stalks while they still had some moisture in them, uh, chopped them into a corn salad, put them in a bag, and let them ferment. So it was basically corn salad with down here and they compared that to wheat straw. They also looked at whether it made any difference whether we had dry ground corn or high moisture corn. We can talk about that, that some if you want, but this is primarily where I'm going to spend my time. The rations were uh, kind of an old style uh, Wisconsin diet or a traditional Wisconsin diet. A little bit more corn silage than haylage, that's a little bit off, but basically like a 50-50 haylage corn silage. 20% corn silage, 20% haylage. A little bit of soy oil, a little bit of roasted soybeans, some bean meal. And then either 13% uh, corn stalks or just under 13% wheat straw. And then they either had 26.5% corn, how much you corn or dry corn. So when we looked at that ration, that ration was 17.5% crude protein, 31% NDF for fiber. So that's a, that's a little higher than we typically run rations anymore. But, um, but when you do research, you have to make sure that nothing's limiting. So we had 17.5% uh, crude protein, 31% fiber, not bad. Uh, Sheldon and these guys might think that's a little bit high in some cases, but not too bad. 25% forage NDF, again, a little bit high on the forage side, but not too bad. And a pretty respectable starch level of 26%. Uh, so it was not a dog ration, it was a good ration. 
uh, performance. They eat about 50 pounds dry matter intake regardless of the fiber source. The ESs are the, uh, the uh, acyl corn stovers. So this is corn stalks and high moisture corn, corn stalks and dry corn, uh, wheat straw and high moisture corn, wheat straw and dry corn. So the dry matter intake was the same for all ranges at about 50 pounds. Milk was slightly higher for the corn stalk diets than for the wheat straw, but they basically, basically ran around 81, 82 pounds of milk. I don't think there really was, you know, statistically there was a difference. If that was in a, in a real herd, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Fat was a little bit different, very <coughs> by the fiber source rather than by the fiber source. But basically the point on this slide is they ate 50 pounds of milk, or feed, and they made 82 pounds of milk, and it didn't make a hell of a lot of difference what we used for the fiber source. Uh, the other thing when we're talking about physically effective fiber, we're putting that in to get rumin, rumination cut to Did we get that? In this case, there was no difference between the corn stover and the wheat straw diets. We had basically 480, 485 minutes of cut chewing. And that's quite a bit of cut chewing. That's pretty good. If you're used to working with the robots or the Lely, uh, the Lely robots with the collars, uh, we want 450 to 470 minutes of cut chewing a day with that. That's, that's having our cut chewing pretty good. We were basically at 480, so we had uh, really good cut chewing and no difference between the corn stover and the wheat straw. They shoot your cut the same. Uh, this is uh, if you have any problems with your labor on your farm, you might want to talk to my wife because somehow she can get a whole pile of students to volunteer to come in on a Sunday afternoon and get dressed up in their coveralls and play veterinary in there, and then they open up the room and uh, cannulas on these cows, and they take an eight ounce milk replacer cup, the old milk replacer cups we used 10, 20 years ago, eight ounce cup, and they dip right into that room and, and they'll, they'll empty the room and out into a garbage can. They weigh the garbage can, they take a subsample of the stuff in there, and then they take their eight ounce cup and they put it all back in the cow. And she can get people to do that for free on a Sunday afternoon. I figure anybody that can get people to do that can manage people. So uh, if you have uh, labor management issues, you might want to call my wife. Uh, back to the results. Uh, we saw no difference in cut chewing, uh, really no difference in milk production. What we did see was uh, we looked at the pH of the rumen and the pH of the manure. And what we saw was with the wheat straw, we had a slightly lower pH, a little more acid rumen with the wheat straw and more acid uh, manure with the corn stover. So what does that mean? Well, if we have corn stover, what we think that means is we didn't form as good a rumen mat. So our corn particles, our, our corn grain, fell through the rumen mat, got washed out of the rumen, got to the hind gut and fermented in the hind gut. So that's why our, our pH is lower in the manure, because we had more of that fermentation going back in the hind gut instead of up in the rumen. Whereas with the wheat straw, we formed a more effective mat, it held those corn particles in the rumen, it fermented more effectively there, creating more acid lowering the pH. It really wasn't acidosis, I mean, I'd like to see that a little bit higher, but, but we weren't into acidosis territory quite yet with that. So it was more acid in the rumen, but it wasn't causing any problems. So they actually, the, 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 the take home was they shifted the site of starch digestion, or a significant amount of starch digestion, just by changing, going from corn stove, uh, wheat straw to corn stover, they moved the site of digestion lower back into the track. Uh, so how does that relate to our 2013 rations? If we had a faster rate of passage, of our, particularly of our fine particles, uh, we shifted that site of digestion, so that great corn that we thought was gonna do real well in the rumen, didn't do so hot in the rumen. Uh, it actually passed out and then didn't actually get digested to the hind gut. That lowered the digestibility of the starch, below what we saw it be on paper. Uh, also meant that as far as to the rumen bugs who were relying on to do our, a lot of our digestion, especially about our fiber and some of our proteins, uh, there was less nutrients available to them and they didn't grow as fast because we were starving them a little bit, particularly from the energy standpoint. <coughs> the flip side to that, or the, to, to add to that, on high corn silage diets, we're in kind of a new age when we talk about balancing for amino acids now and, and Whereas we may be used to do those 17 and a half, 18 percent crude protein diet, now we're running 15, 15 and a half, 16, 16 percent crude protein. Putting a whole lot less protein in that ration. And typically when we go to a corn silage, we're also putting less soluble protein and less variable protein. There's less soluble protein in the, in the corn stalks, stover or corn silage. One is lower in protein, two 
It's just it's less soluble. It doesn't break down in the rumen quite as fast. So we're not feeding the rumen bugs as much protein as we used to either. We're still throwing the bypass in, but we shorten the rumen a little bit now. We don't have that. When we're running that 17% free protein ratio, we had we had a safety factor in there, a cushion for when things go wrong. And we basically took that away as we've gone down to lower and lower uh, protein diets. So we had less rumen and more available protein. And what that means is that's kind of a double whammy. Not only were we maybe not feeding them quite as much starch, but if those bugs are short on protein, they don't use the starch in the same way. And what we actually found was uh, if, and this is again some more research from my wife, uh, if the starch is available, the protein is limiting, what the rumen bugs basically do is they'll digest the starch and then store it inside their body as, as glycogen or microbial starch. What we want them to do is mix it with some protein and make new bugs and multiply. So what we want really is we want a bunch of these, we want a whole mess of these little bacteria. Instead, what we're getting is a few of these fat ones that just fill up. What this is is this this bug just it didn't have enough protein. It just kept digesting starch and stored it. It's basically starch inside itself and it just made itself fat. So we're not we're relying on these bugs to break down our proteins, change our proteins to a higher quality protein, breaking down our, our fiber. And we want a lot of these, and when we can't generate a lot, we're making a few of these fat things, just basically that room is running in like first year. It's not really going. So the bottom line is uh, we were starting to move a little bit. Uh, one, we were having starch pass too fast because of our our <coughs> integrated as it might be. And second, we weren't feeding the protein we want to. So we have to build all the great components. So how do we fix that? Um, my first thought was, well, if we got all these big chunks of fiber passing in the manure, let's throw some straw in there, slow it down, and get better digestion. And uh, you can either say I was batting a thousand, or uh, I was over three. We had three herds. We added straw to, and we had three herds that we lost milk with. So um, not a lot of times your nutrition is going to tell you he loses milk for you, but that's what happened. Uh, so we had to kind of go pull back and think, and basically when we look at it, what's happening is. We, by throwing more straw in there, we had lots of fully digested fiber to begin with. We just added more, uh, so that factor intake down a little bit like we wanted to, but we were not increasing digestibility enough to make up for the lack of nutrient intake, but with the lower intakes. So what we, had, what we figured we had to do is we actually had to add some degradable car carbohydrate in the form of sugars or finer ground starches or a byproduct like gluten feed, uh, and also add some more room to degradable protein, because basically, this would be, if we threw straw in on this with already full digestibility, it's kind of like trying to build a fire with kindling and big, big chunks of wood. It's going to smolder and eventually it'll maybe burn all that wood down, but it's not going to happen very fast. Whereas if we put in some kindling and we put in some little smaller wood and a little bit bigger wood and gradually build that up, we're going to build a lot hotter fire a lot faster. And that's basically what we needed to do in that room was to feed it a little better. We need to shift it out a little gear. Proof. This is a herd from over by uh, Spencer uh, that we did, and, and I'll go through quick as an example. They, they were feeding 30 pounds of dry matter from corn silage, which was shredlage, and 30% starch, so it was a normal starch diet. Uh, a little bit of corn, uh, sorry, <coughs> down, a little bit of grass hay, a little bit of liquid feed, uh, about seven pounds of ground dry corn, some protein mix. And this guy had a computer feeder, he put a little pallet through. The strategy with this uh, nutritionist and this farmer was, that, um, that they tend to, to feed a real high forage diet, uh, a fair amount of byproducts, uh, usually like a distiller with some bypass protein in it, try to make moderate milk for, for a little money. And so <coughs> that's the way the ratio is put together, 60% pork, which is good. 27.5% starch, which is quite high for them and fairly high level, but real high in fiber, 34% NDF and 20% pork. I'd normally like to see this number 24% on average for the herd in 19 to 22 on, on a fresh cow. And our room and degradable protein was borderline 60%. Uh, what the cows were doing was they were eating 50 to 53 pounds of milk and making 60 to 60, or they were eating 50 to 53 pounds of feed, making 60 to 63 pounds of milk. Uh, had great components for one fat test. Uh, excessive rumen fill. The guy said he, could, he thought the cows were going to blow up. They'd go up to the bunk and they would eat and they would eat and they would eat and they would eat and say these huge barrels and they just would not stop eating. Uh, they just couldn't get enough. Uh, cuts when you would think with all that eating would be really good, but it was only 420 minutes. Remember our goal is 450 or higher. 
And then when we sift out that manure, there was a bunch of corn stalks and a little bit. Not a lot of hay manage in the manure because there was no line in the ration. But we had a lot of this stuff just blowing right through the cows. So uh, by the day I got there, the consultant called me in and I got there, uh, uh, the farmer had already pulled his, his corn meal source out and he'd gone from like a rolled or coarse ground corn meal to one that was about like flour. I mean, this stuff was dusty. And then he also went and took out some corn silage. He, he, he took the uh, corn grain from seven to 10 pounds. And what he did was he took corn silage out to do that. When he did that, he actually went up to 460 minutes. How many times do you take forage out of a diet and put grain in and get cut and go off? And what we were doing is we were actually feeding the rumen a little bit better. And you know, he had figured that out and he was feeding the rumen better. And cut chewing went up, intake stabilized a little bit. Uh, eventually milk went up to the high 60s, maybe in the low 70s. His next move was to replace some of the bypass protein sources with the soybean meal and urea. And he did that, we got up into the mid 70s, which is where the farmer expected to be on the type of diet that feeds. So we just had to kick that whole thing in the, in the second year, third year, and get rolling. This is uh, about the third of the last slide, so you guys are in the home stretch, and it's probably what you guys want to see. The whole point that I want to get at with this is we can shift digestion amount inside of digestion by what we use for our forage type, and also our length of cuts can impact that, and also we discuss testing score. So this is not a do-all, be-all, end-all. This is my starting point for a discussion with you guys. And that is, if I'm going to, this is how I'm going to look at where do I set my length of cut, where do I set my <coughs> up at. If I'm a 60% corn silage diet or less, got a fair amount of haylage or hay in the diet, I'm not looking at that corn silage as my primary fiber source anymore. My primary fiber, fiber source is going to be that hay and haylage. So I'm not really worried about my length of cut. I don't mind taking it down to say half an inch or something like that. I'm not sure I really want to go that far. But you can take that down. It's not a big deal because you got that lumen mat coming from your fiber, from your halo. You're okay. So set your length of cut by what's going to pack right in your silo. You don't need to rush your home to get out to an inch, inch, and quarter inch of cut if you don't need it, especially if it's going to make that decrease your bunker density and give you stuff that's going to spoil. It's very counterproductive. Turtle processing score, again, uh, that I think is more. Uh, and that doesn't matter what type of corn salad I got, I'm going to go, uh, I don't mind going a little bit shorter with the cut as long as they got haylage. Kernel processing score, on the other hand, I think is going to vary by my corn salad type. If I got normal corn salad, 28, 30, 32% corn salad, I'm going to want to get that kernel processing score pretty good and get it ground up to make sure I get as much out of that starch as possible because I don't have, I, I've got, uh, I'm not, I've got a lower percent corn salad in the diet, I've got a lot of starch in there, let me use as much as it can. So if I'm a real high corn starch or starch corn uh, silage, like a, a grain style or a, or a dual purpose or 32% starch, I might back that uh, kernel processing score down into the mid to low 60s just for the fact that uh, we've got so much starch breaking down, maybe I don't want it all in one boom right away. Maybe I want to coarsen that up a little bit, try to spread that out. I've, I've got the handlers to hold it in the room longer so I can get away with a little bit coarser grind. If I'm uh, on a high corn silage diet like we are this year, and I got a normal corn silage, uh, either way, uh, I'm probably going to want to go out longer on my leaf and cut because now this has to form my, my room in that. So I don't know if you have to be an inch, inch and a quarter. I think you, again, you got to go back to what, what's the longest that you can still have the pack right. So anywhere from 22 mil out. One thing if you do get out in that uh, three quarter inch or longer, uh, and this again is my opinion, and, and the people from here or you can uh, disagree with me, and, and, and I'm fine with that. But I think when we get out these longer lengths, cut like three quarter inch or inch, we might want to look at a high differential between our rollers and our kernel processing score to try to get a little bit more tearing in there so that it helps it pack better. I'm not looking at a rumen effect, I'm looking at a packing effect. What's going to get it to pack better in my style? I destroy the integrity of those plant cells in my pack a little bit. Um, if I'm on a high corn silage diet with normal corn silage, uh, kernel processing score uh, a little bit lower than up here because I'm going to have a lot more starch coming from my corn silage because I'm not leaving it out with haylage. So I'm looking at maybe a little bit lower processing score, but still in the mid 60s. If I have a high corn silage diet and I've got a grain type corn that's turning out to be like 36, 38 percent corn starch. First, I'm not sure I even want to feed that ration if I have, you know, if I can avoid it. 
vast bit of stuff. We're looking at 24 to 26 percent starch in the diet. And if you're starting out with 80 to 100 percent of your forage coming in at 30 some odd percent, you're going to have a hard time bringing that down into the safe range for the cow. Because this is also the fastest starch you're putting in your cow. This is the stuff. If there's anything that's going to go boom in the room, and it's this. So if you're if you have to feed this kind of situation where you got a high grain uh, and high corn silage, you're probably going to want to back that kernel processing score off. And I'm going to say there might actually be some cases where you're actually going to want to see corn testing in the manure, just so you know you're not burning up for inside. So again, that's just my, <coughs> my thoughts on where to start. I'm willing to have a discussion with anybody. Um, the last two slides, take home message uh, with physical form, whether it's haylage or corn silage, will help, uh, will impact greater passage and extend the site of digestion. So you need to think about that, what the ratio is going to look like. Use that to decide what you're going to set your, your chopper up for. And the other reminder is just because you have a longer chop, you're going to have a more effective fiber level in the ratio, but not necessarily a better room in there. Okay. So uh, my advice to farmers is uh, 12 to 18 months is a long time to feed the long time. <coughs> Put it up right in the first place. Decide what you want before you go to the field. You want to decide what your kernel processing score goal is going to be. Decide what you desire to make going to be. And then, especially, even if it's your own guy, and especially if it's a custom guy, make sure you tell it to the guy that's running the chopper. If he doesn't know what you want, you got no right to complain you didn't get it because you didn't tell him. So make sure you tell the guy what you want, then it's up to both of you to check to make sure that that job is getting done. And as you move from field to field, somebody needs to be doing a recheck to get the wetter or dryer course out is going to impact how that process is. As far as, as how that works, you know, and excuses, you know, there's very few excuses. With proper maintenance and adjustment and I, shear bar and processor rolls, any color machine should be able to hit reasonable goals for processing store So if this is all set up and you're still not hitting your goals, maybe you gotta do what dad told me to do. He used to one day we had uh, we were cold packing or I was cold packing in uh, something in some uh, some alfalfa seedings and uh, I was getting kind of bored, so we kind of just kept kicking the gear up a little bit higher, a little bit higher, and I got chewed out pretty hard. He says, you know, that thing doesn't work very good when it's up in the air three feet off the ground. It needs to stay there. So if you're not getting this done, maybe you need to slow down and put a little bit less through the throat. Now, for a custom guy, you don't want to hear that, but don't forget, uh, everybody both has to be aware that extra processing and slower harvest speed is probably going to cost you extra to get the job done right. So from the farmer, you need to expect that you're going to cost a little bit more, and it will be worth it. Uh, from the, the custom guy or the, whoever's on the chopper, they have to realize that you have to feed that feed for at least 12 months. And if you, if you screw it up, it's going to be a train wreck for a long time. So that's my presentation. Any questions? John? Uh, the next speaker is going to be my boss, so I'm going to read it real nice. Um, <coughs> Chris Hansen, you probably may have bought some of our products in the past and not even realized it. When I started with Wayne Feeds back in New York, back in the 80s, the first that silage and I think we sold was actually made by Chris Hansen. Uh, we've since gone to late marketing under our own name, and when we did that, um, uh, it was a, we, we came up with like a second generation of inoculants, and that was taking a lot more it was a little more technical sale, and we needed to support that to, to prove to you guys that it worked. So John basically developed that whole sales strategy across the country, and in the process of supporting the sale and proving the products works, he's got over 425, 475 kernel processing scores sets in his data set, and uh, well over 100, 125 uh, bunker silo densities. In each bunker silo density check, we do six scores. So boy, is his arms tired. <coughs> so. John's here to talk not about product, but about to go over some of the research that he's got on the processing score and the bunker density. We're going to start with the processing score. Just kind of relate to you guys what we're seeing in the field, what numbers people are hitting, and how they're doing it. So, uh, John Kurtz, we'll uh, take it over from there. Thanks.